Okay, we'll get started. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Tim Hall. I'm a Wharton uh, graduate of 1987. It's a long time ago, but that's when it was, I'm afraid. Uh, on behalf of the Wharton Club UK and the Penn Club UK, we'd like to welcome you this evening to this webinar um, about the COVID-19 pandemic and specifically the mental health issues associated with this crisis over the last few months. Um, and most interestingly, in the UK at least, in the last two lockdown periods. Our featured speaker tonight is Dr. Carrie Wong. Thank you for joining us, uh, Carrie. And I'll talk a little bit more about your background in just a moment. Um, I wanted to say at the onset that this has um, only occurred because of very uh, helpful support. As always, these are collaborative efforts, of course, but provided by Margot Neuberger and Abaku Mills Robertson, uh, both instrumental in, in uh, bringing this to you live this evening. Um, of course, there could be no more relevant topic at the moment as we're all seeing the first and hopefully the last pandemic in our lifetimes. There's little doubt that it's had profound effects on nearly everyone and it'll shape economies, businesses and behaviors of people around the world for many, many years to come. It's created enormous challenges as far as mental health. Uh, we're fortunate today to have Dr. Carrie Wong with us. Um, she's doing an ongoing study, spearheading it, uh, on behalf of the University College London and Penn to look at how the pandemic has affected mental health. Carrie is a distinguished 2010 Penn grad, well done, and received a BA honors in psychology and an MA in criminology. She went on to get her PhD in social and development psychology from Newham College at Cambridge University. Carrie is currently an assistant professor of psychology at UCL. So let's get started. Uh, the format will be uh, me asking Carrie a series of questions during the first 35 to 40 minutes, and then we'll have a Q&A open for 15 to 20 minutes afterwards to the audience. The session is being recorded, as you heard a moment ago, and it will be posted and available on the Penn Wharton YouTube channel. It's also a free event, but of course, we'd be grateful if you would like to donate and support the Penn Center Research on Coronavirus, the link of which should appear in the chat. The event will last roughly one hour. Uh, Carrie has some very interesting slides along the way, as well as several polls in which hopefully you will participate. If you have questions along the way, type them into the chat. Uh, we'll look at them at the end, and assuming we have time, try to address as many of these as possible. So let's get started. Uh, Carrie, can you begin by providing some background and context for the very timely research on which you have been working focused on mental health during the COVID-19 pandemic? Yes, certainly. Well, firstly, thank you both alumni groups for having me. Um, it really is a great opportunity to be sharing some of my initial findings from the study um, and also to be able to um, share the knowledge more widely beyond academia, which is always something that academics are striving um, to do. Um, so a bit of a background about how I started this uh, project. Um, first off, uh, my area of research originally and, and throughout my career has been looking and focused on uh, youth mental health. So primarily, um, you know, I'm, I work with school children and I try to develop school uh, assessment tools that can best assess mental health issues um, from early childhood um, because that area of research really is quite sparse um, and we really need to develop better instruments to assess these constructs earlier on in development so that we can prevent uh, these um, you know traits and states becoming worse uh, later in adult life. So how did I get started with this project really was, um, you know, how the whole world was reacting at the time. I think it was this time last year, Christmas time, already starting to hear a lot of news um, and bustling uh, about COVID, about, um, you know, things going on in Asia. And my family being in Hong Kong and in Australia, we really um, were quite, um, you know, on top of things, I would say, in terms of how the news went, I was definitely uh, worried about my family back in back home in Hong Kong. Um, and it really, all of this triggered uh, what was part of my uh, childhood as well when I was growing up as a teenager back in 2003, when the early 
SARS uh, epidemic broke out in Hong Kong and Asia as well. So then, you know, kind of reflecting on that experience a little bit, now a little older as well, um, I figured, well, actually, now I'm in a pretty good position to perhaps do something about it. And at the time, I was uh, talking to a colleague of mine, and actually mentor back from Penn, uh, Professor Adrian Rain, some of you may know him or have even taken his class. Uh, so we were kind of in conversation and we chatted a bit back in uh, March, April time. Um, when he visited London at the time. And so I, uh, it was from that meeting and uh, conversation that I then, then decided to really get my act together and to put together an online survey. Um, and just to kind of showcase a little bit how um, big this research group eventually grew to, um, we have collaborators um, both from the US, obviously uh, Professor Adrian Rain from Penn, um, but also other collaborators from Singapore and Italy and a large group uh, from UCL, which is where I'm based now, um, and a good group of uh, research assistants also who joined the bandwagon and wanted to help out and learning and helping out um, kind of pursue the study uh, and launching it as well. So this whole team was very instrumental in helping me um, uh, formulate the study, but also crucially, and kind of recruiting um, kind of the first waves and second waves uh, of participants um, as well. So just, uh, give, just to give someone, you know, all of you a bit more of a detailed uh, account of what the study consists of, you can certainly learn more about our uh, study through this website at the top here, globalcovidstudy.com. Um, there you will find, and actually that was how we started recruiting people to complete this online survey as well. Uh, so we compiled a, a battery of questionnaires, all of which are standardized questions that you would uh, use normally in our area of research, but also in addition, some other questions looking specifically at COVID. Uh, the whole questionnaire lasts between 20 to 30 minutes and has been translated to eight different languages. And roughly, we have kind of three waves to this uh, uh, project. The first wave, which was uh, when we launched the survey on 17th of April, um, that was uh, just after a couple of weeks after the UK uh, went into lockdown. Um, and that uh, survey was open until mid July time. And from there, we uh, managed to recruit or had over you know, 2000 respondents of which uh, I, you know, now that we're starting to look at the data and look at complete data, there's about 1,800 or so from that sample. Everyone who was 18 years and above could participate. So it doesn't matter, it didn't really matter where they were from in the world. Um, the link, as long as they had access to the link, um, they were able to participate in the survey. So now we are actually in our second wave of data collection, uh, which started uh, in October and will last until the end of January. So we're still currently recruiting new participants to join this wave if you didn't get a chance to take part in the first wave. Um, but importantly, we were, were really keen on understanding how things may have changed for people in the short six month period since the first uh, wave of data collection. And I know some of you on this call have probably taken part in my study as well. So thank you very much. Um, and you, you know, contributed to being part of the 920 or so uh, participants who have returned their survey um, and are eligible for a 50 pound uh, gift card on Amazon as well. Um, our next plan is kind of to have after closing this second wave of survey to have a third um, wave of data collection next year uh, back in April time. And just to show you a kind of, uh, you know, distribution of where the responses are mostly coming from, um, of course, majority of the participants are from the UK. So in the first wave, we had 40%. Um, and in the US, we had a good, you know, 10, 11 and a half percent, followed by Italy and Greece uh, being kind of larger uh, countries where we got larger responses from. It, way, at wave two, uh, the follow-up rates are uh, presumably always um, smaller than the first wave, um, but we're hoping that these numbers will also increase uh, over time. 
And then finally, just to sum up what kind of things we were asking and what, what these questions really equate to. Um, we were interested in looking at how people's uh, relationships might have changed over time or even during lockdown. So things including uh, how we develop trust in others, uh, how people's levels of empathy perhaps may have changed, or in some instances in the household, how relational conflict uh, may uh, be exacerbated as well, given lockdown situations. We also asked about questions on parenting for, fam for kind of parents uh, who were responding to our survey, including some questions also on how their children are doing uh, um, and faring across the board. Um, in terms of mental health, uh, things we were looking at, um, and most of these things I'm talking about uh, have been also replicated in other COVID studies that are live at the moment. So things including how people are dealing you know, with anxiety, depression, levels of aggression, how good their quality of sleep is, how stressed uh, they might be at the moment, as well as other physical health measures such as pre and post COVID um, levels of exercise, um, as well as uh, alcohol consumption and substance use as well. So that really hopefully gives you a broad summary of what the COVID uh, study um, entails. And um, before I move on, uh, I think maybe Tim will start to ask me some questions as well. Okay, well, thank you very much. That's a uh, terrific uh, context, uh, Carrie. Um, can you maybe talk a little bit more about the mental illnesses that have surfaced during the pandemic and how these relate to demographics like, for example, age and location? Mm -hmm, certainly. Um, so when we talk about mental health, we're really, as you can see here on the slide, focusing primarily on anxiety, depression. Um, I'll be presenting maybe some data on sleep quality as well and stress and levels of loneliness. So think, you know, when you, when, we, when you hear the term mental health, it really quite broadly captures quite a few things. Um, and today I'll be sharing some of that uh, data with you. So um, with the help of uh, Margot, I hope I can first ask the audience uh, two questions um, before I show you the uh, results that I've prepared to share with you today. So first question, hopefully it's an easy question, um, straightforward one. Uh, which age group do you belong in? I can see that there's a quite a good spread actually, which is great. All right, just a couple of people perhaps. And maybe we can share the share the results. So it looks like we have kind of quite a good balance uh, of uh, 18 to 24 and 45 and above in this room as well. Okay. And my next uh, poll question. In your opinion, which group's mental health is most affected by the COVID pandemic? Maybe this is a tricky one, <laughs> but we'll see what the results say. Perhaps we can share the results now. Okay, and so I think most people, at least in this group, uh, suggest that it's the 18 to 24 group, about 47% of you. And quite a few also said maybe uh, other age groups uh, as well. So let's reveal and see what the uh, what my data shows in this study. Um, so in fact, uh, you guys are correct. And um, we managed to look at age uh, and levels of uh, anxiety as well as depression across the ages. So here on the right, you can see a really beautiful, lovely graphic uh, that my research team has created for us today. Um, is that, you know, on the y-axis is levels of anxiety that 
is measured by a standard um, anxiety measure. Uh, this anxiety measure is also used across various other COVID studies. And if you were to uh, read an academic paper where they talk about anxiety, chances are they are using this seven item questionnaire as well. Um, and you can see uh, that the 18 to 24 group that's highlighted um, shows higher you know, mean levels compared to most other groups. Um, and given that the uh, error bars, they do overlap say with the you know, 25 to 34 group, um, but not with the 35 and 44 group just, uh, you can see that actually it is significantly different um, compared to the uh, 35 and above uh, age groups here in terms of levels of anxiety. So in that sense, uh, it does kind of confirm most of what this group is predicting a little bit, that the younger uh, uh, pe people in our sample are reporting, or at least self-reporting, higher levels of anxiety. And let's take a look at depression now. Um, same axes, so x-axis still age, but y-axis this time is levels of depression. Um, and again, perhaps uh, more stark is the contrast that uh, mean levels of depression is, is self-reported higher uh, for the younger group in, our, in my sample compared to all the other groups. Um, and so this you know, trend uh, seems to replicate in a, you know, across different countries when we have looked at this, um, but also across other constructs as well. So let's quickly, I'm gonna present to you also uh, the trends for loneliness. Um, levels of loneliness when we ask people, uh, generally uh, it seems that uh, across the ages there, it's, you know, everyone's kind of affected by levels of, uh, or feelings of loneliness. Um, in fact, it seems that perhaps people in the older group aren't reporting as high mean levels of uh, loneliness in my sample. But generally I would say uh, it affects um, people across the age groups. And when we look at sleep quality, so the y-axis being the higher score, the uh, so lower score, sorry, is poor sleep. So the uh, people actually in our older sample uh, who are older in my sample are doing uh, better, <laughs> having slightly better sleep quality. But again, young people seem to be doing worse off and having poor sleep quality across the board. Uh, similarly, we ask people about levels of stress. Um, and again, here you can see younger people and in my sample, I would say uh, most groups are doing uh, worse or reporting higher levels of uh, stress compared to the uh, older sample in my group. And then finally, we looked at uh, levels of exercise. We actually asked um, participants pre and post COVID um, exercise habits. Um, and this was split into kind of mild exercise like walking um, to, moderate, to moderate and vigorous exercise. Um, given the lockdown situations, generally the vigorous and moderate exercising uh, practices weren't really, um, you know, uh, we didn't really see much variation in that. But in terms of mild exercise, what you are seeing here, um, firstly, there's no uh, gender difference across the board. So the red line for females and males in the blue line, um, the overlapping uh, error bars suggest there's not significant differences across the genders. But interestingly, um, so a lower score, what you're seeing here um, on the y-axis is a score of zero means that um, when we took the difference between um, pre and post COVID levels of mild exercise, we find that uh, you know, the older people in our sample, as this graph shows, um, they don't show any, you know, they haven't been doing much more or much, much less of the mild exercise that they're engaged with. However, for younger people in our sample, it is clearly evident that they exercise a lot more um, you know, before lockdown and before COVID. And therefore you're seeing these uh, really steep kind of negative values uh, here. So people are being um, less active um, and kind of what you would expect um, anyway, maybe for some of your practices uh, as well. Okay. Okay, do you wanna, um, Carrie, thank you very much for that. Maybe we can dive a little deeper into the type of stress people have felt over the last yeah. months and, and how they've changed during, uh, in the UK during lockdown 
1.0 and lockdown 2.0. <laughs> yes, definitely. Um, and actually for that question, I think we have I've prepared another poll question for uh, the audience as well. So if I can get Margot to launch that. So what has caused you the most stress during the pandemic? Unfortunately, you can only choose one of these. <laughs> But in the actual survey, we actually allowed people to pick um, all of them, all of the stressors that apply to them. Okay, so a couple more responses waiting to come in. And great, so let's share the results. Um, it's looks like from our audience members that the uncertainty surrounding COVID, so when it will end, um, how it is spread at the time, at least for lockdown one, um, that's a major, major concern and stressor. Okay, great. So if we close this poll, let's see what our results say. So um, based on lockdown one, so what did we actually ask? We asked participants and we gave them a list of about 30, very, you know, 30 different types of uh, stress um, and asked people to just select uh, the ones that uh, they found stressful, just like how you did um, just now in the poll, but people could select more than one. Um, and it turns out that the kind of about 50, oh, just over 50% of our participants from lockdown one said, you know, the most stressful thing for them was uh, other people not social distancing, followed by the uncertainty surrounding COVID as you had um, selected. Um, people were worried about future plans, um, as well as their mental health and boredom and loneliness. So these five were kind of the top five stressors with over 30% people endorsing um, these uh, stress, these being most stressful things. And actually our results replicate and, and extend a lot of the other COVID studies who are running similar um, questions as well. But what I wanted to also present to you because we're still actually collecting data um, at the moment. And as Tim asked, you know, how have things changed maybe during lockdown too? So here, so next on the next slide, you're going to see the exact same um, items uh, on the left, but what you will see in addition uh, are additional bars that are in blue for lockdown two. So here, um, in addition to kind of the original five top five stresses from lockdown one, if you just focus and look at the dark blue bars this time, you'll see that actually, um, you know, other people not social distancing remains to be the highest with almost close to 60% of people endorsing this, uh, you know, this as the stressor, stressful task, stressful uh, event, sorry, followed by uh, the uncertainty surrounding COVID. So again, things haven't really changed there in terms of the top two stressors. The third one is uh, people finding future plans uh, being per perhaps difficult to plan future things and so forth as being stressful. Um, and then at the bottom here, uh, interestingly, uh, people are worried about other people not wearing face masks and or gloves uh, when they are outdoors. That has actually received 50% of our participants in the 900 or so uh, endorsing this, uh, this item. In addition for the second lockdown, I thought actually it might be interesting to see how people are thinking or perceiving government guidelines. Because I also found myself um, being very confused, especially if uh, you're in the UK as well and, uh, and the US. So uh, it turns out, you know, government COVID guidelines is also pretty high up here. Uh, making the kind of fifth uh, highest stressor at uh, lockdown two. Okay, excellent. So uh, moving to another topic, uh, Carrie, uh, let's talk a minute about vaccines. So in the last few weeks, we've had uh, Pfizer, uh, BioNTech, Moderna, and AstraZeneca University of uh, Oxford come up with uh, uh, very viable uh, vaccines, so it appears. Um, but there's a lot of questions about how people feel about the vaccines. 
have you looked at this and can you talk a little bit about, assuming you have, of course, assuming, uh, can you talk a little bit about your results? Yes, definitely. Um, so uh, vaccine hesitancy is something we have looked at and these were only questions that we added uh, in our second wave of the data collection. So um, before I show you everyone the results, um, this will be the final kind of poll for everyone to guess uh, and, and report your experiences. So uh, thank you, Margo. My question to you is, uh, should a vaccine be available to you in the next couple of months? How likely are you to take it? And in fact, this is exactly the question that we had asked in our survey. Okay. Few more people. All righty, and I think all the results are in. So let's share them. Um, it looks like about 47% again are say they're very likely to uh, take it or, you know, likely. Um, and then about 20 or 40% are unsure or unlikely to uh, take the vaccine. All right, so what do our participants say in our sample given the uh, lockdown to questionnaire? So our participants said something similar, right? The rates are pretty similar to what you guys had endorsed. Um, there's a good sizable uh, group who say they are likely or very likely to uh, take the vaccine, but also there are some who are uh, unsure and unlikely as well. So to follow up kind of the responses, and I think maybe some of you when you were answering the poll, you were thinking, but well, you know, this depends and, and so forth. So let's have a look at to see whether or not our participants say similar things to what you guys are thinking as well. So one of the things, you know, for the category of unsure, so why might someone be unsure about taking the vaccine? One uh, example I've pulled out from the reasons is the following. Um, I am unsure because I'm vegan and I know that the COVID-19 vaccines are tested on animals as well as humans, but humans get the choice of con consenting to this, animals do not. I am unaware how many animals have been tested and what the consequences were, and this saddens me. I am, however, in a dilemma. Do I choose ethics over health? Tricky. So that's one example of someone who is unsure uh, of taking the vaccine. But when we look at unlikely and very unlikely uh, cases, what do we see? Uh, so the first, you know, quotes uh, really highlights that the person really isn't in the high risk group. Um, they're quite fit already um, and that they follow the rules to protect each other. Uh, they say that the vaccine is very new and I would prefer not to take it and continue looking after mine and others' health as I have been so far. Perhaps something that you uh, agree with as well. Uh, many say, and this is not just uh, one instance, but some say, uh, I don't really trust my government to create such important tasks like this. Who knows how many corners they cut. And still others say, you know, they've already recovered uh, from COVID fully. Um, although they think the vaccine is very necessary for society as a whole, they are hesitant to put something in their bodies that, have, uh, that may have such a short length of testing. Um, and so finally, when I looked at kind of likely and very likely situations, what were some of those reasons? Um, people say that the vaccine, if it meant that they could guarantee safety and safety of the, of the loved ones, of their loved ones, uh, and that if they can travel freely, they would take it. Uh, some and many actually say that they believe in the science behind it, uh, the vaccine development, and others say, still others say that it's the right thing to do um, and that this is the way to protect our society um, from uh, and controlling this situation. So I found, you know, these are some kind of interesting anecdotal uh, responses that I think maybe perhaps some of you might share as well. And as we talk and learn more about uh, vaccine hesitancy, perhaps some understanding a bit more uh, detail about why people think 
uh, or choose to behave in certain ways uh, might be quite helpful. So I think, th yeah, that's it in terms of the vaccine hesitancy research. Okay, uh, Carrie, moving on uh, quickly, um, you yeah. know, the press for 10 plus months has been about the negative effects on mental health of the pandemic. Yeah. But just out of curiosity, and I know this is counterintuitive, have there been any positive changes in the mental health of people coming from COVID-19? That's a really fantastic uh, question, Tim, and one that I don't think people ask enough. Um, and you know, when we actually ask this question, or at least let people tell us whether there have been pleasant or unpleasant things uh, in their lives during the pandemic, um, we actually get a mixed range of uh, answers. And it's quite difficult for us to really identify whether or not there, had been, there has been more pleasant things over unpleasant. Uh, experiences and vice versa. Um, but what I can share uh, with you are some kind of anecdotal um, uh, responses from our participants. Um, so, you know, in terms of uh, helping behavior, many people talk about uh, uh, their community being more cohesive, uh, there's more solidarity between people and their community and family members. Uh, there's increase in volunteering and appreciation of others in their family and friends, as well as acts of kindness directed towards NHS and key workers. Um, importantly, also people commenting and saying that there's more hygienic behavior. But of course, these are all kind of anecdotal things that are great to, great to hear about. Um, but if we were to really look at this more broadly um, across, you know, the everyone's responses. A good way of reflecting that are, is this is uh, what I'm showing here kind of word clouds. So word clouds highlights and bold uh, uh, all the words that are most commonly and frequently um, used in this in people's speeches. And here as you can see uh, I've kind of separated the two word clouds for lockdown one uh, in orange. So in the left are kind of uh, English speaking countries, primarily the UK, US and Australia. And you can see on the right compared to the right, where it's Hong Kong and Singapore and China, uh, the key uh, themes that come up or the key words used are pretty similar. Um, except, you know, remembering a little bit that when I, the time when I collected the data, um, it was locked down in, uh, in the UK but in most of Asia, things were actually up and running. They didn't really have full lockdowns as such. And so you can see that some of the things uh, that are also prevalent in the uh, word cloud here on the right are things like hygiene, uh, online learning, access, change. So things uh, that might be at the time uh, quite different to what was actually going on in most of Europe uh, and America as well. When we compare the same word clouds, same questions of how has the pandemic changed your behavior in lockdown two, um, we're finding you know, pretty similar uh, words that are being bolded. Everyone's working online and working from home. Um, and so uh, there doesn't seem to be all that much difference when we look at things broadly. Similarly, we asked the second question um, to, to participants to say, well, what are some pleasant and unpleasant things you observed during the pandemic? And again, uh, separating the two clouds, uh, you can see, you know, perhaps at the time in most of Europe and America, kindness, pleasant things, uh, people maybe are social distancing as well as unpleasant things, right? Pretty similar in size. Um, but in Asia, you're seeing things such as discrimination, there's kindness, but not as hot, not as big. Um, and then there are more, there's more talk about the country about blame, about, uh, you know, distancing and wearing face masks, um, et cetera. Um, similarly, the key terms here, again, I find interesting in Asia, uh, discrimination still is a key theme that uh, persists throughout lockdown one and two that uh, during the UK lockdown. Um, and so, you know, this I think offers a kind of different way of looking at pleasant and also unpleasant things that have happened during the pandemic. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, okay. Final question as we're uh, as we're nearing the end of the formal uh, part of the presentation. Um, one thing that we don't know for sure is how a government or a country can successfully navigate through the pandemic. I ask that um, you know, not acknowledging the fact that China has actually navigated through through this pandemic 
very, very well on the surface, of course, um, as an exception, but the rest of the world seems mainly confused. Uh, there's been a variety of responses. You know, some governments have done very little. It's sort of hands off. Uh, and others have been extremely focused on stopping the spread of the virus, including lockdowns or multiple lockdowns. Yeah. What have these different approaches meant for people's well-being? Um, that's a really great question. And actually, some, the key question that researchers right now are trying to understand um, as well. So I do have a few uh, slides perhaps that might be helpful in addressing this question in particular. Um, but first I wanted to present kind of uh, this chart here. So this chart is a paper that was published in the Lancet uh, Public Health. It's a really prestigious uh, journal and actually all of the articles right now that are offered on there are uh, accessible and, and freely available to the public as well. So anyone uh, can uh, go on there and browse and learn more about uh, COVID. Um, in this paper, uh, I'm, I've, I'm highlighting here, um, this was published in April 17th, which uh, interestingly enough is the date when I launched my survey. Um, and at that time, they had already in this paper outlined kind of things or lessons learned uh, when COVID uh, has hit Hong Kong and what are some things that they would recommend that other, you know, at least lessons learned from Hong Kong and perhaps other countries can, can use and um, learn as well and apply uh, to their policies. So things like uh, entry restrictions, travel restrictions, quarantining people who are at risk, um, tests and trace was already uh, in place at the time. Physical distancing was already, you know, very early on. Everyone kind of agreed at the time um, that it, uh, you know, was uh, important to um, control the coronavirus. Um, but then also the level of uh, adherence to the social uh, measures and guidelines really is quite something. It's quite uh, unique, I would say, to Asia compared to other places, including mask use uh, and avoidance of crowds, etc. Um, and you can see that, you know, even though there was still a curve uh, it, and rise in number of cases and then coming down again in Asia, at least in Hong Kong, uh, you know, this most of these uh, behaviors and practices uh, were already kind of well documented and shared with the world at the time. At the same time, when I asked uh, people this, the question in my survey, so do you wear a mask when you go out uh, here? So the options being no, sometimes, and yes, uh, across the countries and participants during lockdown one, and lockdown two, we get quite low numbers um, in most of the countries that are represented here. A second question I also ask my participants uh, is what proportion of people in your community wear a mask? Trying to get a little bit of an understanding of how things are in places where people live. And as you can see here, uh, during lockdown one for the UK, um, only this is percentages, so only 16% say that they wear a mask when they go out. And within their community, 27% uh, on average. So, um, you know, these rates are pretty similar in terms of how people were self-reporting as well as what was going on around uh, in the community as well. And when we look at the United States at the time, even though they, the US uh, had uh, undergone lockdown slightly later uh, than the UK, uh, the levels of uh, endorsement in terms of wearing a face mask was definitely higher, both during lockdown one and lockdown two. And again, in the community as well, there seemed to be just more consistency uh, in terms of people wearing face, wearing face masks and face covering. Um, similarly for Greece and Italy, as you can see, there's more green coming up, uh, meaning that they are, you know, there's a higher percentage of um, people where actually saying that they're wearing face masks going out as well as the, in their community as well. And then finally, when we look at the numbers in Hong Kong, even though the sample size is a lot smaller, um, you know, we're still getting almost 95 to 100% of people saying they do wear face masks and they still do right now. Uh, in Hong Kong. Um, and so that really hopefully gives you a sense of how things have changed between lockdown one and two. Um, but also importantly that perhaps in the UK where most of us uh, live, it really is quite uh, low in terms of uh, levels of endorsement and wearing a face mask. Okay, that is, uh, that is terrific. 
uh, Carrie, thank you very much. Um, that ends the formal uh, part of the presentation. We're going to open it to Q&A, and that's my uh, job to, to, to shoot the questions to you. So let me, let me start with one um, as follows. Uh, this comes from a participant, of, uh, from a participant, of course, in the in the um, in the webinar. Uh, at the beginning, you talked about your um, findings on age. Uh, mm -hmm. This person is asking: Do your results take into account the idea that younger participants are more likely to report mental health issues in any case, due to cultural awareness of mental health, or at least more so than people in the 55 plus group who may have old-fashioned views? Yes, um, so my uh, analyses don't account for that uh, in particular, but what we do know is uh, surprisingly that uh, there are quite a high, we have quite a high proportion of um, participants who are in the 44 and above categories. Um, so initially we thought, well, actually maybe the participants who are in the younger age groups, um, they are more likely to participate, will get you know, higher ends from those groups. Um, but actually, uh, the reality was not the not true at all. Um, we have equal, pretty much proportionate, uh, sizable uh, sample for each of the age brackets that are reported here. Um, if anything, I would say the uh, 35 to 44 or 44 age group um, is not as well represented as we would have liked. So um, yeah, I hope that yeah that answers your question. It sounds like I think when when it's interesting because this is true of other COVID studies as well, where they found a surge uh, in kind of interest in participating and taking part in surveys online. It could be the the reason could be that because people are locked down, people have a bit more time on their hands. Um, but you know, based on my also my personal experience as a researcher. I actually get more emails from uh, participants who are older telling me and sharing with me kind of things, how things are going with them and how they're not able to sleep perhaps and so forth. So yeah, I don't think uh, it, it, there, it, there's really like an age um, difference in the, in the levels in which people are responding to the survey. I, I think the, that underneath the surface of that, uh, yeah. the real question might be is, you know, today for uh, the younger demographic, uh, mental illness doesn't have the stigma. Uh, you know, it's not kept in the closet, for lack of a better word. Um, you know, the older you are, the more likely you would never utter those words, uh, mental illness, because they had such a negative connotation to them. Yeah. Has that affected your stuff? Well, firstly, is that generally true? I guess just uh, yeah. I'm curious. Then secondly, did that in any way skew any of your results or did you take that into consideration? Um, I would say, I think perhaps the, the, the impression is that young people know about uh, maybe mental health a lot more, um, but because it's in the media, they, you know, they talk about it a lot more. But I wouldn't say that older participants in at least my experience of the sample, that they would necessarily not talk about these things either. Um, I think if given the right situation, given the right you know, levels of confidentiality and everything else in place. I think uh, people are still willing to share their experiences with you, whether or not they label it as, oh, this is a mental health issue is probably a separate, you know, separate idea in, in their heads. But they, but oftentimes I've, I get the impression that um, many people don't, or many people aren't regularly asked these questions. And so completing a survey of this kind where there is no right or wrong answer, it's about your feelings, it's about your ex uh, experiences of things, really does help people you know, reflect about themselves, about their experiences uh, in, on a day-to-day -day basis even. Um, and that can be quite helpful um, as I've been told. So, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, another question, um, how do you reconcile your results to what's being presented in the UK media? Um, so, I mean, just today we were talking about this earlier, even just the uh, comment about uh, vaccine hesitancy. I think many times in the, in the media, you know, headlines will, are very, very misleading. And we know that that's true uh, of most, you know, or any of any news. And I think it's not helpful for, for society and for people's expectations uh, as well. 
Um, and I think, you know, oftentimes that's the struggle that researchers face. You know, we try to be as honest and truthful about reporting results and all of that in a credible uh, way. Uh, but then it gets misconstrued with, you know, by the media and oftentimes misrepresented. But I, I mean, I think it, it just takes a bit more kind of communication between researchers and um, the media uh, for things to be presented in an accurate uh, uh, way. So I haven't had much experience working with many media outlets at the moment, but it's starting to uh, grow as well as opportunities present themselves. Um, but it is an interesting kind of fine line to, to tread on and thinking about how do you actually present something and caveat everything so people understand what it is you found. And do, do you think your results on the, um, in lockdown one or, and two mirror what we are reading then? Or is it, is the press taking liberty or reporting something yeah. different? I would say you definitely from what you're reading, at least depending on what re sources you read uh, from, uh, generally speaking, I would say they are uh, pretty accurate. Um, but sometimes what you, I think everyone when reading the news should also take into consideration that this is still ongoing and a lot of the data, is, you know, is still rolling in and there will be short and also longer term effects. And I think it's really the longer term effects that we should be thinking and talking about rather than these like immediate um, shorter term uh, effects, at least for mental health, primarily because uh, you'll realize that even looking at the data from lockdown one and two, some things uh, don't change. And sometimes things can also change for the better as well for some people. Um, so the conversation I think shouldn't be what's happening, what are people reporting right now in this moment, but more about, well, you know, how do we better help people uh, recover? What are some skills that we should, you know, give people now so it's helpful and that they, in the long term, that's better for them um, and for society as well. Okay, some, somewhat related to that, not to the media, but your closing uh, comments there. Hmm. Um, you know, there's a lot of stress that's been introduced, of course, by uh, by COVID-19. What coping strategies do you recommend? And if a person has heightened anxiety or needs someone to talk to or, yes. you know, whatnot about uh, the pandemic, what, what resources can you recommend uh, people can tap into that might be readily available? That's really great. Well, first, I would say, you know, that's a great question. And thanks for asking. And I actually have prepared some slides for that. But importantly, I think uh, it's really first, first off, definitely stay educated, right on what stay in the know, stay, uh, you know, attend talks like this about mental health. Um, the more you know about it, the more probably likely uh, you're able to share your knowledge about uh, mental health issues and to help de-stigma, you know, reduce stigma that's attached to mental health. Um, my students actually have uh, really kindly uh, created these wonderful graphics to help us uh, think a little bit about how do we cope and how do we uh, recover from some of the stress that we are ex experiencing. Um, and here, if you go to our website as well, globalcovidstudy.com, you will find it some uh, list of resources there available for you, um, blog posts uh, with links to um, kind of programs that have worked in helping us uh, you know, de-stress um, and ways to help you better manage uh, the stress when you are in it. And then finally, I also have other resources on the website uh, that might be helpful for everyone here on the call. If you wanna learn more about uh, COVID studies, there's an active st uh, study network Twitter you can follow. Um, there's also other resources for mental health depending on what it is that you're after. Um, young, young adults, teachers, parents, et cetera. Uh, there are many resources online through uh, UCL where I work, um, but also online there are you know, even lesson plans and things like that as well. So. Um, access to journals and also charities they, uh, that I've listed some here also provide a lot of resources that you can um, tap into and access for help. Okay, thank you. Another question uh, for the, from the audience. Do you feel government going forward will use the experience of COVID-19 um, to work on guidelines for tackling a future pandemic? If so, what is the most important information they should know about the mental health aspects? 
Yeah. Um, so I, I mean, I don't, I can't speak for all governments, but I do know that at least here, uh, the UK, uh, even though they don't seem like it uh, on the news most most days, um, that they actually do seek um, expert advice from academics all the time. Um, so many of the uh, principal investigators who are leading COVID studies, kind of like mine, they are also um, uh, asked for their opinions all the time. So we're constantly feeding our data and what we're finding into policy reports um, and recommendations that we have. Um, and therefore, you know, I would say for academics, it really hasn't been a, a, any, there hasn't been any rest for us because we've been trying really hard to also uh, inform policy as these results are coming in. Um, and so I think uh, they are taking active steps to listen to scientists at least. Um, and that scientists are also presenting and making their case to them, um, which is probably something that is, is they're really putting an effort into doing now. Um, whether or not they then apply and take those uh, recommendations into, and, and into practice, uh, that probably takes a bit more uh, you know, nuance and, and insider knowledge into, into the politics and how things work um, for, me to, for me to comment on. So. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, the questions are flying in, Carrie. So you know. We're oh, gonna, great. Gonna hit you on a wall. <laughs> yeah. uh, it's while it's difficult to quantify the number of deaths this year that could be attributed to an uptick in mental health issues mm -hmm. such as addiction, suicide, and so on. Yes. Do you have any idea how someone could try to quantify this? Yes. Um, I mean, I don't do any research in that area, but I do know of studies that are currently looking at uh, data on, on you know, various sources. So um, I know a few maybe economics professors are also involved with looking at various, um, you know, firstly, getting data from uh, perhaps charities. So charities that are normally dealing with people who, uh, who are at risk for suicide, for example, or many of the mental health charities that uh, work with people and young people uh, of all kinds um, throughout the, throughout the uh, year. Um, so getting data from those uh, groups and then also looking at obviously dial-ins, uh, hotlines, uh, services and seeing, you know, whether there's a huge uptake in that uh, um, and so forth. So I think it's, I mean, it's a, it's a matter of triangulating, I would say, data from various sources, from various charities, from various um, counseling groups that are already working with vulnerable populations, and then seeing whether or not uh, those numbers match up, or at least can give you a upper and lower range of what, you know, what that experience is like during during the lockdown and during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And of course, working with hospitals and, and, and so forth, yeah. numbers there. Mm. Yeah. I, I, you know, it's, it's somewhat, it's just like, it's, uh, you know, difficult sometime with older people to, to say whether they died of COVID or some pre-existing condition, you know, it's a, it's, yes. a, it's not subjective, but it's a, it's a murky uh, area, I'm sure to get a definitive answer to. Mm -hmm. um, another question, how do you address those people that have anxiety or concerns over taking the vaccine, you know, what do, what do you feel about that? How would you, what would you say to people that have anxiety? Yeah, um, I think, well, I think it's a mixture of things and based on, at least from my reading of the qualitative responses I've received from the participants, uh, I would say I've highlighted at least some of the key themes that were evident you know, not trusting the government um, and thinking that, you know, because the vaccine was, has been available so quickly when initially they said, maybe it'll take years, you know, or at least a year. So it's, it's that idea of realizing that actually it's a difference in expectations, right? So how, you know, initially, and, and the media, I think pl pl plays a massive role in all of this, right? Uh, in their headlines, in their, you know, even tweets in some instances, the idea of uh, everything being so instant, right? Um, and I think part of it will mean that we there will there will be a need to have better kind of uh, public health campaigns, um, both nationally and internationally, I would say. Um, but one thing that has struck me is uh, perhaps even just a more basic understanding of how vaccines work, right? Like I think many people are hesitant because they don't know what's 
perhaps going on or how things are how the how things work but telling people the why behind why you know behind how something is made is definitely kind of uh, shedding light on a black box and I think people in in that instance will be more willing including you know the opportunity to even ask questions and I think hesitancy towards vaccine is a legitimate uh, concern and I think um, people should have the platform at least to ask questions, to get um, expert knowledge on things, um, and actually get, you know, hear from the trusted sources rather than just um, make a decision and say, okay, that's it, you know. Um, so I think it's, it's that community, the idea of communication, science communication, and, and so forth. So, yeah. Okay. Another, another question, just to carry on, is um, what are the most common mental health issues reported during the lockdown? And this is yeah. thinking specifically about the lockdown, not the pandemic generally. Yes. Um, so, you know, as I can, I mean, just to caveat that too, it's hard to tease apart the data that, you know, which part of it is based on just the lockdown itself, not being, you know, the guidelines and the restrictions um, versus uh, the pandemic you know, as a global pandemic, pandemic, and it's happening all over the world. Uh, I think those two, you know, those two things are definitely related and have an impact on individuals' experiences. Um, one of the things that, if you do have a chance to look at, actually read papers on uh, by researchers in this area, you'll find that a lot of the COVID studies right now highlight um, levels of anxiety being one of the key mental health things that mm -hmm. are are showing up. Depression, for sure, as I had presented as well, uh, the findings are, you know, consistent with many of the other COVID studies out there. Um, other things such as loneliness um, is also key as well, has been found to be not just key for, as I, as I mentioned, it, it affecting all ages, um, but the idea that, you know, lockdown really has forced and cut, you know, help cut off ties for many people. And in some cases, uh, if they're older as well and don't have access to internet or technology, uh, that makes it even more impossible to, to deal with. And in fact, if I can just go back, um, we actually, you know, now have submitted a paper looking at loneliness as a key risk factor um, of lockdown. So lockdown levels of loneliness already, uh, even during normal times, is quite pretty high and a, and a key concern um, for societies. But during lockdown, it has been even more of an influential and a risk factor identified out of all of the other mental health uh, ideas that, you know, I've presented here today. So if you're interested in learning more about this paper, uh, what we found, um, how levels of loneliness fluctuate during each week of the lockdown um, in, our, in our wave one data, do have a look on our website. Um, and this presentation by a PhD student is actually, is fantastic. You should check it out. Um, and you can learn more about that as well. So I would say, yeah, anxiety, depression, loneliness are kind of the key uh, things that are, are seen. Um, that said, there are also things that I haven't measured in this study, including, um, you know, domestic abuse, which is also reportedly perhaps um, have been uh, rising. Um, and, and so there are also things that are probably uh, underreported and underrepresented in the literature as well as in the news that you read about, simply because it's, it's really difficult for us to even access and measure. Okay, yeah. a couple, a couple more. If we can steal a little more of your time, sure. uh, a question came in. Um, it's sort, it's sort of a twofold question. Firstly, do you think individuals are more likely to seek out mental health treatment, such as therapy, during the COVID nineteen pandemic? Mm -hmm. And the follow on is, do you think uh, seeking help for mental health has become any less stigmatized due to the pandemic? Hmm, a very good question, and I, I don't have a like, I don't know the stats uh, or the numbers for that question, but I would say there is probably a rise in number of people seeking help. Um, and those, and in those instances is probably people who are really, really desperate already. And maybe nor during normal times, they would have access to these services, but during lockdown, they just, they simply just don't have that um, service anymore. Um, what we, what I do know from the literature also is uh, that 
uh, people are talking more about mental health, it seems like. Uh, it almost seems like an inevitable topic of discussion now, at least within my circle. But I mean, that would I would be interested in seeing what audience members think uh, about whether or not you guys are thinking or, or, or talking at least more about your mental uh, health in addition to kind of physical health that many, you know, many of us are used to talking about. Um, I think my gut feeling would be there is an increase um, and I'm hoping through this pandemic that people will start caring more about uh, mental health um, all the way, you know, right through to very young children, all the way through to uh, older people in our, in our society as well. So yeah, I'd, I'd love to know what you guys think about that question as well. You don't have a poll? Just kidding. Uh, uh, poll? <laughs> I could actually, but it might take me some time to, to do that. I don't think I can do that in time. <laughs> That's okay. Okay, there's one, we're gonna have one more question since we're, uh -huh. uh, since we're running out of time. So do, do you think, again, this is sort of a subject, subjective question as well, but I think a good one. Do you see a space for employers mm. to be taking a more active role in addressing mental well-being? Uh, astounding, yes, I would say certainly. Um, I would say, you know, previously perhaps mental health has taken a back seat, right, with the stigma that surrounds it and, and so forth. So um, many, I, I don't know how many, but hope, hopefully in this, on this call, uh, maybe some, the, the idea might resonate with some people on this call, which is that, you know, everyone is stressed at some point in their lives. And in terms of the work that I do as a researcher and as a, you know, assistant professor teaching students is that I can equip them perhaps with a better understanding of stress and mental health and how they can better cope with uh, stressful situations. And I don't doubt that many people who work uh, in, in industries that are, you know, in banking, you know, and so forth and trading, those are high strung kind of uh, occupations and stress definitely is a key risk factor for many of the mental health uh, issues that we see. So it can come in many different forms, you know, and uh, obviously it's bad for your physical health, but also your mental health as well. So I definitely think employers should uh, make it a priority um, given, you know, in lights of the pandemic that there should be more resources for their staff but also thinking more broadly about uh, actually, if you don't take care of your of your staff, they are going to leave. They're going to have higher uh, sick leaves and sick days. They're not going to be productive. They're not going to be happy, and you're going to be losing talent uh, all around, uh, all around as well. So, I think making mental health a priority is is a, is a must. Um, yeah. Yeah, so it's, it's uh, um, I, you know I have little doubt that that's the trend for sure. Um, yeah economically makes sense anyway listen you were you were terrific carrie thank you on behalf of the wharton club and the pen club of the uk we we really appreciate you taking the time to uh you know not only to appear but to do the work to prepare the slides and and all the uh research you've done behind it it's been very very interesting so uh thank you and thank for all the participants on this uh this call and and for your questions and so forth and for answering the polls okay. yeah yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everyone. Have a good evening. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Okay.